once again, we are talking to Keith Smith. He is a host of the front office show, contributes to the Celtics blog, which is part of SB Nation, and writer for Spot Track. Now, Keith, let's get into this game preview, all right? Knicks just came off with a, a big win against the Cleveland Cavaliers last night, you know, so we're feeling pretty good uh, because we don't have Mitchell Robinson right now. We're down our top, uh, our, the anchor of our defense, top shot blocker, rim protector. You know, he the Knicks were leading in second chance opportunities, and that was because of him. He's just uh, an elite offensive rebounder, and so we're missing him. So for us to get the win over the Cleveland Cavaliers, who have Jared Allen, Evan Mobley as their front court, that's just huge for us. So coming into this game, this is another tough matchup. Celtics are number one in the East. You know, you got Tatum, you got Brown. If Smart comes back, you got your big three again, and that's going to be grueling. So for me, this is for the Knicks. You know, this will they will need to play a perfect game in order to keep up with Boston, even with all the injuries that we have, and we can go through all that in a bit. But the one matchup that I'm looking at right now, and you mentioned that he could be returning, uh, you, and you wouldn't be surprised. It's Jalen Brunson versus Marcus Smart. And, and for me, it's because Brunson defensively, he, you know, he's he's a small point guard. He's not, he's not gonna be a lockdown defender. He's gonna he's just susceptible to mismatches because of his height. But what he does do is that he can create his own offense, right? right? Good isolation score. He's a good playmaker, you know, really has catapulted this Knicks team to being really competent and sufficient in the half court because of his, com his composure, having that experience in the playoffs. So this is the matchup I'm looking to get looking at because Marcus smart, he's a top tier defender, man. He's a dog. Like th there's no better way to describe him. So that's my key matchup going into this game. Would you agree with that? Are you looking at a different matchup? What are your thoughts? Yeah. He, he's assuming smart plays. I, I think that's a good one. Cause it's kind of the, the head of the snake for both teams, right? Like it's point of attack guys. You're going at it. I think, uh, if smart plays, look for some of those possessions where they put him down in the post against Brunson. I know Tibbs doesn't like to switch, right? It's you, you got to be able to hold your own. I want to, you know, want to you know, we're going to ice those pick and rolls, but we're not going to be a super switch heavy team where we're, we're going to kind of, you know, you, you got to defend your spot uh, with that. It, it's one of those things where I think it's a lot will depend on who else plays. If Jalen Brown plays, then if Boston is relatively whole, you're going to see someone is going to try to do what they can to get Jalen Brunson on the block and go after him. A uh, little bit less so, but probably some of that with Quentin Grimes too. Not a uh, good size for a guard, but he's not Brown and Tatum type size guy. If Smart doesn't play, I think the key matchup becomes RJ Barrett and Jason Tatum. Um, Barrett has done at times a pretty good job on Tatum defensively. Like mm -hmm. he does a good job getting up into him. Um, and then there's been other games when they've played and it's like, he's not even there and I don't know what's going on with him. So that's where, you know, that's, I love RJ Barrett, but man, bring the consistency and like the kid's going to be an all-star. It's just this, you know, sometimes he's there, sometimes he's not. And that's where it gets a little messy uh, with him. So that's, that's, I, I think the big thing, I think, the biggest thing that'll be is who's healthy for Boston, who actually plays in this game and who doesn't. My guess is probably everybody except for maybe Marcus Smart, but but we'll see. Okay. Okay. So let's go through that injury. Let's go through the injuries real quick because as of right now, and I'm looking at ESPN and uh, you know, looking at ESPN right now to see who's in and who's out. Right now you have Marcus Smart who's declared as out. You have Jalen Brown as doubtful. Uh, or not doubtful day to day. You have Al Horford as day to day, and you also have Malcolm Brogdon as day to day as well. So with all those guys, who you're expecting Brown, Horford, and Brogdon to be in tomorrow? Yeah, I would expect. Um, what Brogdon is, by all accounts, and we don't know this for certain because he hasn't, as far as I know, said anything. It sounds like there's a baby on the way, and I don't know where that mm -hmm. is at for him. So we'll see with him. Uh, Brown is. They said they rested him because he woke. He had an adductor injury that kept him out for about a week. Then he came back and played. Then he was a little sore. So they they held him out against Miami on the back-to-back -back because he woke up feeling a little sore. My guess is with the day off, he's probably good to go. Horford will be in there. Horford's, he doesn't play the second end of back-to-backs now. He's That's the point he's at in his career. He plays the front end, does not play the second end. So he'll definitely be in there. So probably... And smart we'll see my guess is probably not just the way that injury looked brogdon's a little more up in the air but i think brown and horford will both definitely be out there okay and just looking at this list and i, and I gotta ask because 
you know, the Celtics are looking to make that deep playoff run and get back to the championship. Do you expect them to be making any moves by the deadline to improve this roster, especially when you see injuries like this or guys who need some maintenance? Yeah, I think that they're, they're definitely looking. They're, they're looking at adding a wing. They're looking at adding a big um, if they can, just to kind of have that depth and that just, just in case kind of guy there that doesn't tend to usually come on the, the trade market though. And that they're, kind of limited in what they can deal because any of their significant salaries belong to key rotation guys. So it's not, you know, mm-hmm. it's not like they have, and I'm not picking on Derek Rose, but the Knicks have Derek Rose at, you know, 13, 14 million, not in the rotation. Mm-hmm. That's you can trade that without subtracting anything from your roster mm-hmm. as far as your rotation goes. Celtics don't have a guy like that in their rotation right in, in their on their roster right now, I should say. So that's a little tricky. It's there's not going to be any kind of big moves that they make. I think where they'll be more active is on the buyout market. They'll wait and see okay. all right, who pops free. You know, all right, this guy came free and we can go get him. That That's what I think you're going to see them do is they'll add another veteran or two uh, guys who are probably at the phase of their career where if I don't play very much, that's fine. Like another Blake Griffin type who's just kind of on the mm. back of the bench. He plays about once a week and he's good with mm-hmm. that. And off we go. And if they need him, he can play a little bit more. That's probably more what they're looking at. Okay. Okay. Now getting back to this matchup, you know, you, you, you spoke on like RJ and the inconsistency and definitely we saw that. Uh, I see that on a night to night basis, especially the defense, the defense is kind of taking a step back. So when you talk about Tatum and, and RJ, you know, I was at that game, RJ's rookie season where Tatum had that step back baseline jumper. I was in, I was at TD garden. I watched that after Marcus Morris hit that big three. So just don't give me another thing like that because that's how shaky his defense has been this season. <laughs> but his offense, he's now to come together. His offense is a little bit more consistent. He's more patient. He's not pressing as much. His playmaking is starting to show up. So I can see how that's going to be a key matchup as well. Um, I'm just curious because for the starting rotation, you know, Quentin Grimes is our best defender. I'd probably think, you know, I think height-wise he's going to probably be guarding Jalen Brown just because I think asking – because was Tatum like six eight, right? He's like six eight, six nine. I think I think yeah, he's, probably, he's Grimes, six nine, probably closer, really closer to six ten. Wow, that's that's a gap because even there were some times where we saw Grimes defending Pascal Siakam, and I was like, it's a bit of a stretch. Um, he did he he held his own, but it's it's a lot to ask. So I would expect Grimes to be defending Brown, who I feel like I don't even give enough shine to, man. Uh, uh, <laughs> who should probably get more shine because. You can even add, you can even throw that in there that he's probably a big reason why Tatum's able to look like an MVP on that team as well. We're talking about uh, our previous co- our, our earlier talks, but what do you expect from Brown uh, in this game? Because I feel like he usually shows up for all these Knicks games too. Yeah, he, Jalen Brown, his he used to be kind of like RJ Barrett, where it'd be like, all right, Jalen Brown scored thirty tonight, and then the next night he'd score ten, and it'd be like, all right, that's how we're getting to be a twenty point per game scorer. That feels a little. Not great, right? If, you know, but everybody will tell you, give me 20 every night versus 30 and 10, you know, back-to-back nights. Like, it's just not where you want to be. So I think with Jalen Brown, it is, as you look at it, is now he's consistent. He, he, he hits the jump shot. He gets to his spots. He's super patient now when he drives. He doesn't overdrive and, you know, kind of go crashing into guys. He he remains, he's, he's well, Robert Williams is the best athlete on the team, but Brown's mm. very close second. Um, he's, you know, his straight line speed is unbelievable. And then he can just, he's that guy who you look like, all right, he's going in for a layup. And then the next thing you know, he's punching one on you. It's like, Oh, mm. I didn't, you know, that, that came at the last second when he kind of got there, he decided, you know, what, I'm going to dunk this. Um, he's, he's tough. I, I think you're right with your matchups. I, I think Grimes will probably check Brown because he used to be with Jason Tatum you'd put a small guy on him because he could disrupt his dribble, get up in underneath him. And it really bothered him. Now Tatum's tightened up his handle enough. That doesn't necessarily bother him, but what he loves to do is he loves to take smaller guys into the mid post area. And then he just, without even a dribble, he just turns and shoots over him because they're just, they're not going to bother his shot. You've got to have some size and length to get to his jump shot. So that's something they'll, they'll seek those matchups out if they can get them in transition or on switches or whatever it is, they'll look for those. But yeah. And it's, I'm glad you said that about Brown because the way I think of them is I, I think of it as they're, they're two number ones. It's, 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 it's not a one and one a, it's not a one and a two. It's not a, uh, you know, Batman and Robin. This is more like Batman and Superman in a lot of ways where it's mm. like, you know, they're, and I'm not saying they are, 
you know, that level of guys, you know, necessarily, but that's how it's seen in Boston is like, Hey, these guys are both the guy, maybe Tatum, not maybe Tatum is a little bit further ahead and JC can do a little bit more in his game. He's a little bit more of a um, consistent, better defender than Brown is Brown picks and chooses the spots on that end of the floor, but they two, two all-star guys, probably two guys that are going to be all NBA level consideration. I mean, that's, you know, in a league where everybody wants good wings, the Celtics have, in my opinion, easily the best wing duo in the league when you factor in the fact that they sure. play most often nights too. They, maybe that could be Kawhi and Paul George, but play more than you know 10 games a season together, and then then we can have that conversation. Absolutely. And you know, out of out of the two, I, I've always you know, I just love basketball in general. And when I watch those two, I always find myself liking Brown more than Tatum. And I think it's just, there's, there's just, there's just something, as you said, like the deception, I feel like I like Brown's deception, like athleticism, how he can play. And to be honest, I also like the way he played in the finals last, last year is that he really, he was, he was top shelf the way he Mm -hmm. was performing, you know, in, in a lot of aspects, he was carrying that team too. So really like how he stepped up in that, in that performance. But for me, man, getting back to this game, I'm really more concerned with, your play style, you, you know, you talked about launching threes. The Celtics put up their second most in the NBA when it comes to launching threes at about 42 threes per game. Now, you guys are also great percentage rise. You're in the top 10. You're number nine in the NBA with making with the three-point percentage at 37%. As a Knicks fan, especially since Tibbs loves to rely on drop coverage, you know, we've seen it bite us so many times, man. We've just seen it bite us so many times. And that's going to be my biggest question coming to this game is, will Tibbs make that adjustment to stop the three-point launches? Because, you know, you got, we we get that. We we understand that the, the t- it's going to be, t- this t- the Knicks love to stop, but they love to protect the paint. It's a little bit more difficult without Mitchell Robinson there. Sims is doing a fine job. Harnstein, eh. But teams have been killing us on three, man. And that's where I think this game is really going to come down to is can the Knicks keep up offensively? Because when you have, you know, Brunson, RJ and Randall hitting from three as well, and it's not as consistent as what the Celtics are doing, then we can have a game. But if we're not going to be hitting our threes and the way we play defense or or defending the three, that's how that's a major concern for me. So I guess my question for you is, is this three point percentage number like, is it inflated because there's just nights where the Celtics are really hot and then really cold, or are they very consistent when it comes to making threes? Yeah, they're, they tend to be more consistent. What happened was they started out and they were making everything. And that was why they were historically good offense to open the season. Mm. Then where it went after that was it turned into, they were just pretty good, like just, you know, average. And then they went through a stretch in December where they couldn't make anything and it was really tough. And now they're coming back into, they're not at the level they were in the first month or so of the year, but they're back to hitting at a pretty good clip. And that's and what it is, is they create them in a lot of different ways. And why they're so good is they create a lot of wide open ones, whether it is tacking drop coverage, dribbling directly into them themselves. They've got a whole bunch of guys who can do that. Tatum can do it. Brown can do it. Smart can do it on the nights where he's hitting. Derek White can do it. Brogdon can obviously do it. Even Peyton Pritchard, they'll let him do do that on the nights where he's playing pretty good uh, with that. They've got a bunch of guys who can screen to open those shots up. So whether it's Graham Williams, if he's out there, Al Horford is obviously a great screamer, screener. Rob Williams is really tough. Uh, as Williams' gravity increases as he rolls, that just tends to open things up even more at the arc. Uh, they're also really good at driving kick. They, they, they're spacing all year. Even when they're not making their shots, the spacing remains pretty good and solid. So so their offense is just really tough. It, it's very funny to talk about a Boston-New York matchup where it does feel like whoever is better and can outscore the other one is going to win, which seems weird because these are two teams that over the last few years have been more reliant on their defense. Mm -hmm. But the Celtics defense, it's still good, but it's not what it was. And then when I look at the Knicks, their defense is real, especially over the last like 
three, four weeks, it's really started to slide. Like they're, they're now, I think out of the top 10, I want to say they're like 13th or 14th, uh, depending on which metric you use uh, to, to measure the defensive efficiency. And it's just a little weird where it feels like, man, they became a pretty good offensive team, but all of a sudden now we're sliding that way. So I, I am with you. I think a lot of this probably depends on who's making shots. Say if you're making shots, not, not to go all, uh, what do they call it now? NBA today, uh, make or miss league. Um, you know, like they like to play, but I, I do think that is part of it. It's it's who's making shots is going to be a major say in who wins these games. Yeah, absolutely. That's why this three point shooting is going to be very interesting for me because the Knicks, like we could score on the paint, but I also look at the Celtics length, right? The versatility of this team. You guys got Robert Williams, Al Horford, Tatum, like those three alone, that's protecting the paint pretty well. And, you know, sure, Randall, Randall's really good when it comes to to contact, when he gets down on the block and he wants to be physical. RJ can be physical as well when it comes to driving. But it comes back to Brunson, man. And Brunson has continued to impress the way he's able to use his footwork, create separation, you know, 15 feet or in from around the basket. So I expect him to get his, but more so on him is like, you got you got Marcus Smart who's going to be on you if he's back. And then you got to go into a wall uh, of defenders. So that's why this three-point shooting, you know, if, if we can get a replicate, like uh, a repli- like something similar to what we got yesterday from Randall, it's definitely going to help us a lot. But, you know, there's another part of this game too that we got to discuss, and that's the bench, all right? And interesting, interestingly enough, this used to be the Knicks' strength. Now it is not. We are 26 uh, in the NBA when it comes to points off the bench, but the Celtics are not to th- that far ahead. They're the 20th. So the bench is, even though it's, I would say, a little bit more well-rounded right now than what the Knicks have, we're not that far apart for our bench units. So give me a little bit of, uh, give me some of your thoughts about the bench. And, you know, especially with Missoula's strategy, because earlier in the show, you mentioned how you don't want to be playing Tatum and Brown that many minutes. He kind of can go that direction too. And you want to see them not have to do that because as you also said, they were gassed by the finals last season. So do you think, do you see, how, how do you, how does Missoula plan to utilize this bench? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Assuming he plays, you can pencil Malcolm Brogdon in for probably 15 to 20 points. That's generally what he gives them. Mm-hmm. And part of the Celtics bench struggles is, that's the only guy you know for certain is going to give you best mm. production as far as scoring goes. So he gets the bulk of it. Grant Williams comes down to, is he taking shots? Cause if he's taking shots, he generally hits at a pretty good clip, but there's every once in a while, he goes through these weird stretches where it's just like, he won't shoot. It's like, he doesn't, doesn't feel like he's open enough or he's like, I'm going to drive every close out instead of just taking the shot and those kind of things. Uh, it will, will they, the bench has been weird because they haven't had Robert Williams for a large chunk of the year. Then when they got him back, Jalen Brown went out for a brief period of time, and they've just been in a weird spot. If they've got their guys, you know, then Peyton Pritchard will probably play some if Smart is out. It's, again, highly relying on is he making his shots. If he's making his shots, which he tends to do at a pretty high rate in Boston, um, that'll be a lift. They can get anything out of Sam Hauser. That's another lift. But the problem is he's just not doing anything right now. He's just Ooh. been completely gone missing. I mean, this guy was shooting like 50% from yeah, three in that. the first two months. And now he's down like under 30. So it's like, and he's, he's very, he holds up better defensively than I think. He gets that typical, like, oh, he's a slow white shooter. Like, so we can attack him on defense. He actually holds up okay um, defensive. But holding up okay while shooting 50% is great. We'll all live with that. Holding up okay on defense while shooting 30% from three, not good. Get him out of the lineup. So we'll see what happens. I, I you know, they're Joe Missoula is kind of mixing a match right now a little bit. One thing you'll see is to close the first quarter and probably the third quarter will be Jalen Brown with three or mm. four reserves. And then to open the the second and fourth quarters is Jason Tatum, usually with three or four reserves, depending on how many guys deep uh, Missoula goes. He'll play Luke Cornett. We'll get in the mix there, especially where the Knicks almost always have two bigs on the floor. Boston will probably match with, with that. I don't think they'll go small all that much uh, in this game. I think you'll see you know, Rob and Horford play a lot. Grant Williams will play a lot with each of those two guys. Cornett will get in the mix uh, with them. He's, uh, he's not what 
he was with the Knicks. Cornette doesn't do the three point bombing anymore. Like, <laughs> like the old days, he's mostly playing around the basket, um, but he's been really good for the Celtics. As far as a fourth big goes, can't ask for a whole lot more. He's been productive as a screen setter and a role man. Uh, and, and he's, his uh, defense has been okay. I don't know if you've picked up, he, you watch enough of the Celtics. He does that goofy, they call it the Cornette contest now oh, where grief. you know you match him up against like Julius Randle and he doesn't close out, but instead he jumps straight up from, you know, 20 feet away and yeah. does it to try to block. And it's the numbers show you it's been fairly, you know, effective, but a guy like Randle who can actually put the ball on the floor He'll catch him with that probably a couple times where he'll he'll throw the fake. Cornette will will do the contest, and the next thing you know, he's driving because he didn't actually come out and close out or get in his way at all. So that becomes a little little odd. But yeah, I mean the bench is good. Their bench is solid, but it doesn't. They don't necessarily always produce in ways in terms of points scored and those kind of things. They ask those guys to do a lot of other stuff instead. Julius, I hope you're hearing this, man, because if Lou Cornette is out there and he's getting, he's jumping in the air, you better give that pump fake an attack, man. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. You know, it, everything that you talked about for the Celtics bench kind of r- rings true for what, how the Knicks have been operating off their bench. You know, our guy that's been pretty consistent since he's been back on the bench is Emmanuel quickly. You know, when Brunson was out during the last week of December, quickly was a starter and it kind of helped him getting those extended minutes helped him get back into rhythm. Now he's shooting well. You know, we're able to see him attack the paint more. He's utilizing that floater, drawing fouls. His playmaking is up. So th- that aspect, like when you, who's the most reliable guy? For you, it's Malcolm Brogdon. For us, it's Emmanuel quickly. And the question is, will everyone else, you know, fill in and contribute? You know, Miles McBride, I'm not going to lie, last night he shocked me by the way he attacked the basket. I've never seen him attack the basket so aggressively. He's usually very passive. He did it once. I was shook to be honest with you. So <laughs> if he can, if he can replicate that type of intensity, because on defense, he's going to be a hound. So I already know what we're going to get out of him. You know, Isaiah Hartenstein, he had a solid game last night, had the big play against Donovan Mitchell, just being a wall to stop Mitchell from driving the paint, getting a game tying bucket. So it'll be, let's see. I want to see from Hartenstein if he can give us some consistent games because he really hasn't been utilized as the way we want him to see, like being a passing big scoring, Sims has been treating him like he's, you know, like a Mitchell Robinson or a Jericho Sims as being this rim protector, which last night he showed it, <laughs> you know, uh, that was shocking, but he, that's not really, I feel like who his entire game is, even though he, th- even though he said that he can do those things, I see him more as like on the offensive side. And I'm hoping to get a little bit more of that because we saw four assists from him last night. And I'd hope he can continue that going into this game because we're going to need as me- as much playmaking as possible to going against the Celtics. And then, Got to ask you about this guy because you tweeted about it earlier this week when the Knicks played the Raptors, Obi Toppin. It seems like he's getting his legs back. Even in your tweet, which I'm going to read word for word for Toronto, New York Knicks thoughts. I don't know, Raptors, whatever. You confuse me. Boucher is way up there for most confusing Raptor. I agree with that. This was a game to try Randall Toppin front court. I 100% agree with that. At least a little. Obi was cooking. And then the last one, as we already touched on, was next up for RJ's finding consistency. He could be an all-star if he does. So we touched on RJ. Let's get to that Obi Toppin thing because you saw him cooking. You watched that game. You you said you could see the Randall Toppin front court. We've seen a little bit of that this season. What are your thoughts on Obi Toppin? And, and what did you see from him that game and, and overall? Yeah, he – I love – the energy he plays with. Um, we talked about it with Jalen Brown, that straight line drive speed straight down the court. Like he has that. He's got that athleticism to get up, um, you know, and do a lot of things around the basket area. You can give them that vertical spacing. I really, it's funny because I said this to somebody and then I said it like a few games later. I was like, Mitchell Robinson is out. Maybe we'll see some top and a Randall. And I was like, no, that's on me for being the idiot. Like, it's just never, I just feel like it's never going to happen. Right. I just say it's for whatever reason, Tibbs doesn't like it and doesn't want to do it, but there's certain games where I feel like that's the one to do it. Right. Like, like that Toronto game, they play a whole bunch of dudes that are the exact same size. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't necessarily need to have, Jericho Sims out there. I want to say that night he played like 25 minutes and that's not a knock on Jericho Sims. I think, you know, he's done well and I kind of agree with starting him just to leave everybody else in their roles. Mm -hmm. But I I think the idea is I would just like to see on the nights when Toppin is hitting his jumpers, he's playing with energy, he's doing stuff on the glass. Those are the nights to say, 
all right, you know what? Instead of going back to Sims for the second rotation, you stay out there, Toppin. You're going to stay. Julius Randle's going to come in, and we'll, I'll figure it out. Deal with it. You know, fine, Toppin, you slide over and play a little bit at a little bit at the five. Maybe Randall will play you a little bit at the five. Whatever it is, you, you can you can get into that. But it's, it just seems like he's destined to Julius Randle plays 38 minutes and he's gonna play his 10. And that's life. That's just how it's gonna be. And it's it's tough because I think he can do more. I think he can really help this team. I think there's a lot of things he can do. I just want to see see it and there's those games where it's like this is the night and the celtics are another team they they're not gonna put a ton of rim pressure on you where you have to be super worried about it and here's the thing too is if all of a sudden you're playing topping and randall and boston gets downhill for three straight layups fine yank them out and say see this is and then say hey idiots like keith smith this is why i don't do it right because it, it becomes this kind of mess and then all right, I get it. I can't really counter, but man, I, I like it. I, it's it's funny when I look at the Knicks roster. There's a lot of guys that really like Emmanuel. Quickly is one of my favorite players in the league. Mm. Loved him coming into the draft. I have this thing for tough little guards. I love the fact that he got on the boards at Kentucky um, yep. as a little guard. You know, he's only about six foot three or so. He can shoot. I, I'd like to see him get a little more consistent with the shooting. Um, it's it's been a little odd. I thought thought he might develop a little bit more into being a point guard instead of an off ball guy, but it's fine. You know he'll carve out a very long uh, productive career with that. I, I do like um, I like Jalen Brunson a lot. Again, tough small guard. Like he can he was just going to give you everything he has. But I really love Obi Toppin. Man, I would just it just feels like every time he gets in the game, good stuff happens, and then it yep. lasts for five minutes a half, and then you don't see it again. And that's for me, that's just not enough. And, and you know what? I, I I sent out a tweet saying, you know, it's just watching him come back off an of injury. Maybe it's a little bit of, you know, uh, how he's trying to get comfortable back on the court because of his leg injury. I think also it's part of it, like how is the coach utilizing him and thinking of how to get him engaged in some of these games. But you know what? Since playing against Toronto, it seems like he's found his confidence again between playing Toronto and Cleveland these last two games through 21 minutes combined. He has 25 points. He is shooting <laughs> six of eight from downtown. You know, he went one uh, one for two from the free throw line. Uh, he's what? He's got nine for, let me do so, nine for 13 from the field. Like, he is just efficient once he gets on the on the court. He's got you one assist, one steal, and four rebounds during that time. I would like to see him do more on the rebound, on the boards, but you can only do so much when you're out there for 10 and 11 minutes. So yeah. I, I understand that. But yeah, he's I, just such it, an impactful player. I just want to see more of him as well, being part of the OB Hive myself. <laughs> and I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but for me, it's like I want to stop talking about him as one of the most productive per minute players because let's just let him be a productive player, right? Yeah. Because some of that per minute production will slide down a little bit because I think part of it is he knows I'm going to play five, six minutes per half. So I'm going to go hard. In my mm -hmm. five or six minutes, I'm going to sprint the floor. I'm going to sprint to my spots. I'm going to, you know, crash it hard to the rim and those kind of things. And that'll change a little bit. If he did turn into a 25 minute a night guy, that'll change into a little of like, all right, we, you can't go that hard all the time because you just, you don't have that kind of energy built up. But I just feel like it's, you know, let, let's see, you know, because I think there's just something more there that he can really help that team with. And he just, you know, it kills me that he doesn't get the opportunity. Absolutely. And I look at him as like how he helped last night being so hyper efficient in his minutes. I look at him being that pivotal contributor next to Emmanuel quickly for this Knicks Celtics matchup. You know, if you get quickly going and you get top and going, I, I think it's going to be a, it'll be a tough, a, a tough matchup uh, for the Celtics. But like you also mentioned, you know, you talked about the staggering of like Tatum Brown and all those guys with the second unit. And that's what the Knicks do as well. That's why it's so fascinating how similar it is between the Knicks and the Celtics where, you know, we'll be either RJ Barrett. Sometimes you'll have Brunson and Randall out there with some of those guys. Like they really try to mix and match or even sometimes Grimes with the second unit. Sometimes it like, that's where I'll say like Tibbs has improved as coaching, like figuring out how to stagger these minutes. But I also mm -hmm. think it's out of necessity as well, because those are your top three scores, you know, quickly can give you some scoring topic could be hyper efficient when he's on. But if you need some consistency, it's going to be between our big three or as everyone likes to joke the mid three, but <laughs> that's where most of the scoring comes from. So sure. Keith, you know, thank you again for coming on the show. Let's wrap this thing up by giving our score predictions for this game. So 
What do you got going? I'll let the guests go first and what, how he thinks this game is going to turn out. Hmm. It's tough because I think it will be higher scoring than what yeah. we maybe think. I think Boston's going to – they haven't been home in a week, and they haven't been home a lot in the last, like, month. So I think they're going to really get a big lift from the crowd. I think they'll be mostly healthy. So I'm going to say Celtics – say something in the 115 to probably like 108 range i think i think they'll win but i think it'll be close i think the next thing it seems like these teams generally play close game feels like they either play really close games or just massive blowouts you know and it's it's not close but i i think this will be close i think the knicks will keep it close but but celtics in the end outscore them hit a few more shots and that's how they win i think this is gonna be a close one to be honest with you i do agree that it's gonna be high scoring i think it's gonna be a close one it will come down to who makes the defensive stop when needed. Um, so I'm going to go with, I'm a, you're choosing Celtics. I got to choose my Knicks, man. I'm going to go. <laughs> no. uh, I got to go one. I think it's going to be a little higher score than we expect. I think it's going to be like a 117, 114 affair Knicks going, going out there. I feel like something it's, you're right because it's either both teams show up or no one, sh- or like one of the teams don't show up at all. I feel like with the Knicks coming off this big win against Cleveland, I would hope that they have some sort of confidence going into this one. I I, I don't know about the defense for this one, uh, just because like last week, you know, just to give you some numbers, <laughs> you know, we had, uh, you know, even though this game went to overtime, 123-121, loss to the Raptors, 116-105, loss to the Wizards, 139-124, loss to the Atlanta Hawks, 125-116, loss to the, to the Raptors again. Now, it was a lower-scoring affair for this one, but 105-103, so I agree that's going to be in triple digits. That's just how the NBA is going this season, but I think it's going to be closer to the games that we saw previously just because I think this is going to be a little bit more of a difficult matchup uh, defensively. Now that we've said that, it's going to be like the Celtics Knicks games I grew up on as a kid. It'll be oh, a good 95 Lord. 90 rock fight. And oh, no my goodness. Make a jump shot. And it'll be like, what happened here? Like, what, you know, well, why is no one making shots? And I, I, I don't think it'll be, you know, guys getting dropped on the paint with, uh, you know, and then laughed at as they, you know, picked themselves up with blood pouring out of their noses and stuff. But <laughs> hey, 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 that's not the NBA anymore. But, you know, just now that we picked both picked a uh, high scoring game, it probably won't be. It's just how it goes, right? <laughs> Oh, that's that's usually how it goes. And I, I think I'm gonna be at this game too. So I'll, I'll be there in person. So hopefully it's not a a, a brick affair. Uh, hopefully it's some <laughs> good offense, good pace to the game. Hopefully no uh refs wanna just make the show up for themselves because yes. that's another issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody wants that. No, nobody if we want to watch a free throw shooting contest, we'll go down to the CYO on a Saturday and watch the, the kids shoot free throws. <laughs> not, nobody wants that in an NBA game. Let the players decide it.